I have no idea what size the file will end up being. So I'm recording it to the cloud and we'll just see if we can find it out there somewhere when we're all done. And frankly, um, I have a feeling that we may be doing this um, again before too long. And maybe the next time we'll be better prepared. But uh, many of you know me. I know many of you, maybe not all of you. Mute your mics, please, uh, unless and until you need to speak. Uh, my name's George Shear. Um, I've been involved with the Flying Club for a long, long time. We'll talk about that a little bit. I've uh, been the chief flight instructor since before I could remember and probably before I was all gray. And uh, what, why I have asked you all here, um, this is a challenging time for all of us. First of all, let me just say, I hope that uh, your family are safe and well and uh, bearing up through all of this. Uh, my kids are sequestered at home and uh, trying to deal with online learning as we are here. And um, we are a little inept at it so far, but so are their teachers. So um, I, I'm not going to relitigate the decision the club made to stand down from its flight operations. I will only say that we uh, are not closing the club. The club endures. The club will continue on. and. Uh, Measures are being taken in the background to make sure that happens. Um, you all probably know that uh, one of our concerns when we decided to put down flight operations for a while was simply the livelihoods of some of our instructors who depend on instructing to pay the rent and keep the lights on. And so uh, we know that there are some of our instructors who, who depend um, day to day, week to week, month to month on that. That was a real concern. And lo and behold, um, not an official action of the club at all, but a incredibly generous gesture on the behalf of a number of members who organized a GoFundMe campaign and 100, 150, 200 more members who funded that to help some of those instructors who really need the help tie themselves over. Uh, when I checked this morning, they raised something like $12,500. And I'm uh, told that some of those funds will start to be distributed in the next few days, which uh, is speaks a lot to how we've handled this crisis. Uh, we recognize the people who were going to suffer from it the most. And the club members stepped up to mitigate that, that impact and to make it clear that they appreciated what our instructors do for us and to make sure that they will be here when the dust clears and we can all go back to flying. And I just cannot tell you how proud I am of the club and how much it says about the members of the club and about the sense of community that we have developed here. And that's really sort of why I wanted to do this for a couple of reasons. Um, I want to celebrate that. Um, I want to say thank you. Uh, I, not every flight school has um, been so generous and has exhibited such a sense of community, but I, uh, I'm, I'm moved but not surprised at what our members did. The other thing is I want to try and find a way for us to keep that community alive, a way for us to uh, meet together and talk about flying opportunities for our instructors to continue to teach um, by this means or some other distant learning means. I've spent the last two or three days with um, another of our instructors, longtime club members, Dwight Fry, who in an earlier lifetime was a software engineer. And he has built a, uh, what for the time being, we're going to call a learning center, which is really just a way for instructors to um, schedule and offer um, opportunities to meet with club members online and uh, cover topics that they want to cover, teach about one thing or another. A lot of our instructors are reaching out individually to their own students and finding ways to do that. Uh, Heinz has done a lot of remote work with people who happen to have simulators in their homes, helping them continue with their instrument training. 
so we've built this learning center. We're going to try and roll it out probably tomorrow, and it'll be a place where instructors can go and mention things that they would like to teach, and uh, our members can go and select things that they would be interested in learning about and hearing about, and hopefully we'll make that match. And if some of our members feel as though they are being offered something of value and would like to make a contribution to those, that individual instructor. Um, the instructors can decide how they want to handle that. Um, if anybody would like to you know, chip in a few bucks tonight, I'm just going to direct them to that GoFundMe campaign, which goes to the instructors who need it the most. But you'll see all that tomorrow, I hope. Probably tomorrow afternoon we'll be able to roll that out. I'm going to have a, a sit down like this with our instructors tomorrow morning. Uh, to go over it with them and introduce it to them. So uh, those are really the two reasons that I wanted to do this. I wanted to kind of start what I hope will be an ongoing series of sessions like this. Um, some of them may be more tutorial, uh, more pedagogical, I hope so. Um, and also just to talk a little bit tonight about uh, how the club started, some of the crazy people who have moved through it over the years and how we came to this place, uh, which I think is a pretty great place. Uh, we've endured through a lot of hard times. This will be hard times as well, um, but uh, we will be here. And uh, our job is just to take care of each other um, in every way until that happens. Um, hey, George, it, it's Brian Tsar. There's a number of folks that are trying to get into the meeting that uh, need you to let them in, if you could uh, see. Yeah. Yeah, these are people coming in late. I uh, just admit it all. And Perfect. Uh, thanks for that heads up. Uh, I think that was, yeah, Ren Babcock tells me that he was a few minutes late because dinner was in the oven. Lucky guy. Um, thanks, George. Thanks. And if, uh, if, if I'm going off the rails or, or missing something here, speak up and let me know. Thanks, Brian. And uh, thanks for your contribution to the aforementioned fund. Uh, okay, um, as briefly as I can, uh, I my relationship with the club started back in the 1970s when I came back to this area and uh, walking across campus one day and saw a notice posted on the wall, do you want to learn to fly? And I said, yeah, who knew? And uh, so I went to a meeting and there was this energetic uh, young guy there talking about how I could actually learn to fly if I wanted to. Um, turns out his name was John Hunter. And uh, next thing I knew, I found myself in a ground school meeting in campus, uh, a building, I think, in the English department, as I remember. And uh, it was pretty interesting. And then one night after class, uh, Mr. Hunter asked me, if I wanted to go flying with him. He had to move an airplane over to Raleigh for some reason. And uh, and I said, yeah, heck yeah. So I found myself out in the dark at Horace Williams Airport, climbing into what I'm assuming now is a 150. And uh, I would not have known it from uh, a golf cart at the time. And we flew over to Raleigh and did whatever we came there to do. And we flew back and I was pretty much hooked and uh, got my certificate and uh, then found out that flying is actually pretty expensive and couldn't afford it. I was trying to make a living as a writer then, which is worse than making a living as a flight instructor. And uh, so I put that aside for a while. And then one day I blinked my eyes. It was 10 years later. I saw my certificate and I realized if not when, now, and if not who, me, and uh, started flying again and got my CFI and because uh, I wanted other people to pay for my flying. And then I discovered that it wasn't about flying actually at all. It was about teaching. But I also discovered that I like teaching more than I like flying. And I like flying a lot. So there we are. And I uh, blinked my eyes again. And here it is 30 years later. And I'm old and gray. And uh, I love it as much as I ever did. Uh, and uh, I want the club to endure, and I thank you all for being here and for playing your role in it. I'm going to ask John to step up and tell us just a little bit about uh, his history with the club and 
both of us, I'm sure, as you know, could talk for a long, long time about those things. But then I'd like to move on to talk about how the club started, some of the people that have passed through it over the years, and uh, where the club stands now and some of the challenges facing in the future. And then we'll see what you all think about those things. So, John, please. Turn your mic on. Well, thank you for your uh, introduction, George. Um, I will also say here for just a moment that those of you who haven't been around so long um, may not realize that the Flying Club is in many ways the house that John built. Um, uh, John was here a long, long time ago. He wrote the bylaws for the club. He created the first checklist for the club. Uh, he probably did not teach the first ground schools, but he has been teaching them since uh, the 1970s. Uh, in, in many ways, it's the house that John built. So I defer to him on those things. But start with the most important question. What kind of a student was George? Well, I will say this. When I decided I wanted my CFI, I asked John if he would train me. And he said, uh, I'm too busy. So... Uh, I had to go to a fly-by-night flight school out in Oklahoma, which has long since been shut down for letting all kinds of riffraff through and God knows what other violations. Uh, and uh, I came back with a CFI certificate. And like all instructors, learned to instruct at the expense of my first 10 students. God helped them. And uh, although some of them are still my friends. And uh, there we go. So that's a good question, John. Well, I'll, 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 I'll answer that differently, John. Uh, George has been a quick study with the flying all along, including in the first ground school he was in, uh, that he mentioned there. Um, and uh, and I'd, uh, the reality is at that time, although I had trained a number of CFIs, uh, I was feeling strongly that for those who had grown up in the club, and this has to do with safety culture here, uh, and had all their training in the club and knew nothing else, that it was appropriate to kick them out of the nest for at least some of their training so they'd have a wider perspective of uh, how the rest of the world is, is accomplishing training and, and, and a professional flight school would be different than us. And so that's why I asked George to go out and do that because I thought he would actually bring back more to the club than he left with. And I, and I think he did, not in the ways that I expected perhaps, but- uh, If that's your story, John, you stick to it. That is my story. <laughs> So anyway, uh, George asked me if I would outline my history with the club, club briefly, uh, and then I am in a position to uh, talk about uh, more of the history of the club, which I think is important because it set its culture a long time ago. Uh, but I'll say this, I started flying uh, uh, in late 1959. I got my first certificate in 1960, and I... Um, uh, was living with my parents at that time and uh, went off to college and didn't have any money to fly. Ended up here in uh, North Carolina uh, and decided uh, uh, when I was in graduate school that uh, I well, discovered that there was a club out there at Horace Williams Airport and thought I'd get back into it. And so I did so and uh, now I'm embarrassed to to quote the specific year, it was either 73 or 74, I can't quite remember at this time, but it was right in that area. And um, uh, having got into it, uh, and I, uh, I trained with uh, one uh, Chuck Williams and uh, George Menson's characters who were involved in the club. There were both, and it's interesting to me over the years to not only note the fabulous people who were involved in the club and just enough of them uh, to keep the wheels on and to set the tone. But there were also some folks who um, chapters and novels could have been written about uh, with amazing things that uh, would astound people both negatively and positively in the club. And we went through eras with, with that happening every now and then again. Uh, Chuck Williams was one of them. Uh, he was the a lone instructor of the club uh, in those years, the only one around. He was also the mechanic for the club, uh, the only one around. And, and this was a part-time because he also worked in construction, otherwise to make a, a real living. And uh, I won't go into him very much, except for the fact that uh, he was mercurial and um, <clears throat> was, uh, uh, how do I say this? Uh, 
uh, came with a chip on his shoulder and, and often got in literal fights with uh, other people, not in the flying club, and was very blunt about how he uh, expected training to happen and, and so forth and so on. But we can get back to those characters at another time. Um, but what I want to say is that what I found in the club in the manner of people like Dick Rolf, who uh, you all don't know, of course, um, who steered me to the club originally, was a member. And some of the people I met there, uh, Don Johnson uh, was an original founder of the club in 1961. So he'd been around at least 13 years by then. He was a professor at uh, UNC. Um, and there were other uh, really very dedicated people uh, on both sides of the equation. I'm thinking Lou Semrau and, and Jay Levinson, uh, they were on the board uh, and, and uh, Andy Dobelstein, uh, all these people who had started the club in 1961. And then uh, there was a character called Pebbly Barrow, uh, who I interacted with a lot. A delightful kook, <laughs> if I may say so. Uh, lived hand to mouth, loved flying, never got to do any, but hung around and helped build some of those tea hangers out there uh, that survived for the next 40 years uh, with telephone poles and scrap lumber and, and scrap uh, uh, roofing that he scavenged from various places. Um, but that's who we were. But the, I think what, what attracted me the most through some of those people I mentioned was a notion that this was a, a community of, of, of flying enthusiasts. And they supported uh, someone like me who was fairly young at the time. Uh, and they really wanted uh, flying to take root in, uh, in, in this area. And they liked the idea of a club and they really emphasized that. And, and everybody was welcome, of course, it was very small at that time when I joined. Uh, it had three airplanes. Um, it did, at a time in its life, get down to two airplanes. And one of those times we almost expired and disappeared off the face of the earth as a club. Um, and um, uh, a ragtag fleet in the sense that it wasn't coordinated or anything. They were leased airplanes that some of the, the board members had, uh, um, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, George, <laughs> very good had uh, you know, leased to the club and bought themselves and leased to the club. We had a 172 that uh, Don Johnson had. We had a Tiger that Jay Levinson owned that uh, it really wasn't a flying club airplane, but he uh, took people up in it and, and let you fly a little bit, all good and all that. Um, and we had a 150. And that is where we started from when I came. Uh, the club had been primarily up until that time a one club airplane for a while, a 172 with Don Johnson. And, uh, and then they had a Citabria for a while, uh, which lasted a couple of years and then uh, was taken off lease because it didn't fly as much as people thought it would. Um, and so uh, it, there it was, and we were struggling uh, quite a bit. Um, At that I, time, wasn't it a university associated flying club? Yes. Uh, well, and not at that time. We were just free from that. It's a good point. If you want to go back in history, uh, the club was originally founded as a student activities uh, club through the student union. And there were some students of Don Johnson, uh, who was uh, teaching in the uh, uh, School of Business, who wanted to uh, get into flying. And they organized it uh, as students and went to the, the student association, which funded them a little money, about $100 or something like this, and made them an official student organization. And what happened was that the administration of, of UNC found out about this or, or fathomed this in about a year and a half, two years later, and basically said that uh, for liability reasons, they couldn't have a student club that, and associated with the university in that way, and this club would have to be independent. And so that's when it was reorganized and the uh, didn't officially have anything to do with the uh, university after that point. I forget when that year was. That was before my time. So when I got there, there was a bunch of people on the board who uh, uh, had ponied up the money to uh, uh, have some airplanes for us to fly. Uh, dues were, uh, I think, $15 a month uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, and the, air, the flying, flying time in those days was probably about $25 an hour, uh, which uh, is just a factor of, of when we started. But in any case, uh, I wanted to say that um, there were some other people who came along very quickly who really brought with them and, and wanted to promote the club concept. Um, and now I, I wish I had memory that I don't have for names, 
Um, but um, there was a, a woman whose name was come to mind right now, uh, back in the uh, mid 70s, who organized uh, the first of our flyouts and was a social gadfly, uh, got meetings together. Uh, she and myself and others established a tradition of uh, uh, a quarterly meeting at um, uh, one of the restaurants in town, Chapel Hill, a, a pizza place uh, down uh, by Eastgate. Um, and we would meet there and, uh, and have programs and try to put things together. And we grew. Um, we grew until 1979, which was, uh, may still be the, the most active year of the club when uh, I was instructing by then. And uh, we had um, five trainers uh, on, online. We had four 150s that the club owned. We had Ernie Moline, who was an instructor who brought his own 150. Uh, we had a couple of 172s, a couple of uh, Piper Warriors, and a 182. And uh, it was, we were just going gangbusters. And during the summer uh, of uh, 1979 on into the fall, probably in October, we averaged uh, over 100 hours per trainer per month. Uh, and I was busy assisting with maintenance at that time already. And uh, that was a very busy time. And as m many of you may know, right after that, there was a recession. And we went from going gangbusters and getting a lot of training, a lot of people into flying to the next year just about expiring. Uh, we had to get rid of airplanes. The, um, in those days, the only way you could sell an airplane was put it on, in one of the trade of plane or national advertising, which before the days of, of computers meant that you had to send a letter and a check uh, to the trade of plane uh, out in the Midwest, and then your ad would appear in a week or two but the price of airplanes was falling so rapidly we couldn't sell them. We'd, we'd choose a price that was barely above what we owed the bank on the airplane and represented a huge loss for the club. But by the time it was posted, it was already uh, one of the higher priced airplanes in that field. So we had a real, real hard time. And that was a very critical time. We were down to two airplanes uh, in, uh, in early 1970 and, um, and losing money. Uh, so we, we reorganized about then. And then what happened was that the, the club was technically bankrupt. Uh, that meant that um, uh, if the uh, bank had called the, the notes that we had and, 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 the, and the airplanes we had sold, for instance, and things like this, uh, or if, if everybody had stood up and quit and said, I want my deposit back, the club would not have been able to do that. Um, so what happened was that uh, several of us, myself and Doug Tilden and Ray Kirk, um, organized a little corporation to buy the remaining airplanes from the club and lease them back to the club at a rate that every time they flew would they'd make the club money. And the only way we could do this was basically do all the maintenance ourselves uh, that we could possibly legally do and uh, do all the uh, uh, administrative work to keep it going with the idea that uh, we wanted to see the club survive. And in that mode, we went through the 80s. Um, uh, and then the idea was that when times were good and the club could afford to buy the airplanes back, we sold them back to the club uh, so that the club could own them and, uh, and take the, the equity with them that way. And that's what's happened. Uh, the organization that was called Performance Aviation, that's who we were. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there were a couple other members who moved through that, uh, who bought in and then left when they realized it was not making any money. Um, and uh, I think we did a, a service to help the club come to a, a good place financially uh, so that uh, it is where it is now uh, and from that direction. So um, that's just the club side of it. But again, the camaraderie in the club, the, the meetings that we had, the flyouts, was a very, very important part of it. And I began to feel as an flight instructor uh, that we really needed to up our game in terms of safety. Uh, so uh, we started the ground school. That The first ground school was the one I taught. There hadn't been one previously at all. Uh, and um, the idea was to try to formalize our training in some way and then have standard operating procedures, which we didn't have. So uh, writing those and bringing to the board to have them passed I think has helped us a long way to focus on what we need to do and, and, and keep our nose to the grindstone in terms of having a safety culture, which uh, is an interesting beast. Uh, it's not as easy to explain to many people as it is. 
So I will pause there because I could ramble on forever, but I just want to emphasize again what a great place the club has been and what a joy it's been to be part of the club. And I, I and some others, such as George, and, and I can enlist probably, if I could think of all the names, about 20 or 30 people over the years have been absolutely dedicated. <laughs> Where'd you find that, George? Um, uh, to, um, uh, to seeing the club be a success and be a social organization, as well as a high quality place for learning how to fly and, uh, and getting into aviation. And many club members uh, have gone on to the airlines. Uh, that's one route. And many, of course, have done flying just for pleasure. Uh, and, uh, and, and George, more than I now, hears from people from way back who would still check in. But uh, for, for many years, when I was more plugged in and, and doing all the instruction, I was chief flight instructor for a number of years. Um, I'd hear from people I haven't seen, you know, hadn't seen in, uh, um, oh, you know, three or four or five years. And, and the common theme was I'm renting airplanes at this airport, wherever I am in Michigan or New York or something. And I just can't believe it. What a good situation I had when I was at the flying club in Chapel Hill. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't know, you know, what a good deal it was. Now that I'm out in the real world, I understand that. And those kinds of things are gra very gratifying. And I, I think George has probably had the same experience uh, in his tenure. Uh, there were some, several people after I was chief flight instructor, and then George basically has been doing the job for about, what, 25 years now, George, straight. Um, oh, I, uh, I stopped counting. Community. Yes. So I'll stop there. And, and, but I wanted to leave it on that note because I'm feeling very good about the club. Um, hanging in there as a social organization, working with each other to support safety and to support uh, a healthy camaraderie uh, to keep flying going in this area. I'll pause. Thank you, George. John, did you run into any resistance when you started initiating things like checklists? And uh, I ran across recently in some old documents, one of the first uh, checklists you made for the, what now has become the 50 hour inspections we do on our airplanes. Right. Yes, there were some, uh, and that is part of the safety culture issue. There were some people who didn't start off that way, joined the club, or just had different ideas that somehow when you got to be a private pilot, you did things your own way. And checklists were just not popular among some. Many people uh, did uh, uh, get, get on the program and started to use checklists more rigorously, uh, which opens the whole point of an instructional point of view that this, is, this evening is not intended to do. But... The idea of learning why and how to use a checklist is so important, as opposed to just seeing it as an impediment or something that you're supposed to do, but it's not really necessary because you're smarter than that and you know what to do anyway. This, this is a, it's a hard, hard sell sometimes, but once it's part of the culture, it works. Well, as you know, um, I'm a big fan of Atal Govundi, the doctor who writes about this, wrote that book called The Checklist Manifesto about use of checklists in building trades and a lot of things. And he makes two good points. He said, the problem is we think checklists are for people who are not as smart as we are. And uh, uh, that's clearly a fallacy. Uh, and we uh, fail to appreciate how difficult diligence and discipline is. We think, uh, well, I could use a checklist if I needed to. It's actually hard to use a checklist. But that's another topic. Yeah. Um, so uh, the club has been through a number of different insurance brokers over the years and different underwriters. Um, were you involved in some of that early on, uh, negotiating for insurance? Because underwriters don't really like flying clubs much. Yes, that, and I was. And I, I can't remember the guy's name right now, the, the agent. Uh, he did, uh, I forget where he worked out of, but he moved down to Raleigh and had an office in Raleigh for a while. Um, and uh, th that was the first time that uh, um, we took our, our standard operating procedures, which we developed at that time. Uh, and this is after I was working for an airline. See, a lot of this comes from the airline industry. When I started to work for an airline in 1980, um, I, I was doing th that kind of work, literally doing the writing the checklists and, and going to the FAA for approval of each checklist item, of course. 
uh, and that's what you have to do under Part 121. And so I, I started to migrate some of that to the club, thinking that there is no the big division as people think there there is. Everybody thinks that well, the airlines are are not general aviation, and general aviation does it differently, and and it's it would too much bother. But in reality, the the um, the principles of checklists, as an example, are so important to anybody who flies uh, that you know it needs to be done and done properly. So uh, we had the standard operating procedures, which were first, and uh, it turns out that he he owned up uh, kind of like saying, you know, is it okay if I um, show these to other clients? Uh, I have several other clubs and flight schools. I'd like them to look at these. Uh, turns out he was doing that already. <laughs> That's what he owned up to uh, and passing them around because the whole industry uh, at the lower end of general aviation was not focused on that yet. Uh, it was a little more kick the tires, light the fires, let's go flying type of thing. So uh, it did, uh, it picked up, you know, quite a bit uh, for us. Uh, and this is not to say that we didn't have incidents and accidents. We've learned the hard way. We overall have an excellent safety record that all of us can be proud of. Uh, but uh, we've had our hiccups along the way. Our record statistically is still much better than the national average in general aviation. But every time there's an incident, or an accident, it sure is painful to see where we've let ourselves down and how it came to be that way. Yeah, um, I, looking through some old documents, I uh, came across something that uh, is kind of maybe the nadir of the club. Um, which, um, this, this might have been the low point of the history of the club. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we talk about it a lot. I know you talked about it at the ground schools. I do. Um, and uh, maybe the saddest thing that has happened in the history of the club. Um, but um, you and I have had many, many discussions about this, um, the whole concept of safety and how safe we are and why we are as safe as we are. And uh, um, as you and I know, I have a list of about 30 incidents and accidents that we've had over the years, uh, most of them minor incidents but this clearly was the worst ever. And I think you and I completely agree about this. And uh, there's not much to disagree upon. I recently reread the report to the NTSB about it. Um, and I know, is there anything you want to say about that? Because people do talk about it sometimes. Well, I certainly talk about it in each ground school uh, as a, a, um, a lesson. And uh, it, it, it was the fact that we were trusting how do I say this? When you build a safety culture, you have to trust the, trust the people will understand and, and move on to do that. Um, but we learned the hard way um, that uh, in this case, uh, although when more applications you know, came in, there, there was a, a line saying, you know, have you ever been convicted of a DWI or you know, uh, you're addicted or whatever? And, and everybody, of course, answers no on that. And this uh, young man certainly did as well. But it turned out that it, 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 he was not that what he represented himself to be at all, although he was a very friendly and, and a uh, cheerful guy, buy his soda and you know, offered to get them something out of the vending machine for you and pay for it. And um, and uh, it turned out that he had a serious, serious alcohol problem and uh, didn't even have his driver's license. It had been absconded by the state for obvious reasons um, and uh, went down and drank a bit <laughs> to the point where he tried to fly back to see his girlfriend at, uh, in the wee hours of the morning and ended up shredding himself through a forest uh, uh, near Pittsburgh, an oak forest. And that picture is, is a very sober one. You see the tire uh, right there and the, the airplane was completely, you know, destroyed on the way down through the oak forest until the, the biggest parts were like the tires and the, and the wheels. Uh, everything else was crumpled or buried underground. Um, and um, this, uh, is yes, from, this is from this is from the <laughs> NTSB report 
um, the handwritten report. I think I recognize that handwriting, but yeah, you do. <laughs> uh, you notice um, uh, entered the trees at over 200 knots. This was in a Cherokee six, as I recall, or That's some correct. variant of it. And uh, uh, this is what sometimes we unkindly call suicide by airplane, but it was clearly the one fatal accident we've had in all of these years at the club. And I'm not sure if it's the sort of thing that can actually be prevented. Sometimes people are just, uh, uh, you know, have failures of this sort, but it is why we uh, check driving records to this day. And uh, it's why we occasionally, yep. um, occasionally decline membership for people, not often, but sometimes if there's something to suggest that uh, this might be a habit of theirs or might possibly be in their future. We can't tell you that you can't fly, but we can tell you that you can't fly here. And that has happened. And there are a couple of other situations where um, we did foresee an unfortunate future uh, for someone and uh, it happened elsewhere and not with us. But we, um, unlike a commercial flight school uh, who's going to teach you to fly and then uh, send you off to fly somewhere else, when we teach someone to fly, we are then going to hand them the keys to the airplanes that we all hold together, that we all own together. And uh, it's a different level of commitment. Uh, we are going to watch, we're going to teach you to fly, and we're going to give you the keys to the airplanes that we all share ownership in. And, uh, and it's a different level of commitment, and I've seen it time and time again. It's part of the fact that we are a community. We're not just taking people's money and teaching them to fly and then wishing them good luck. We take a continued interest. Um, so why do you suppose it is difficult for flying clubs to get the sort of insurance we have? I will say that um, I, I know I see many people, well, not many, but I see some people on this call who have um, worked with our insurance over the years and, uh, and are very familiar with it, in some cases more so than mine. But the situation is just that if you or I go out and purchase an airplane and decide to insure it, you know, unlike an automobile, you don't have to insure an airplane. But if you decide to insure it, the underwriter is going to know everything about you. They're going to know your flying history. They're going to know your credit score, a whole lot of other things too, probably. Uh, and underwriters don't mind risk. They just don't like risk. They can't calculate. And when they insure the flying club, they don't know who's flying these airplanes. They trust us to train them properly and to um, trust them to um, be responsible and fly safely. And so it's a, it's an open question for the underwriter and they put a lot of trust in us. And so far it's worked out well for everybody, I think. That, that, that's a really good point you're making, George. Uh, because that was, uh, you, you referred to it earlier, that in, traditionally insurance companies do not like flying clubs. Uh, the reason is that um, it's one of the, the social aspects of a club that can be dangerous. In, in particular, if some of the, uh, uh, the key uh, movers and shakers of the club are getting a little sloppy, it's very hard for other members, especially um, if that person has been around forever and was the founder and so forth, uh, starts doing things that are a little sloppy to stand up and say, you need to, you know, shape up, you, you need to, uh, you know, do better. Um, and we, we see it all the time. I, I, recent history, uh, uh, my younger brother is involved with a, uh, a club, uh, a soaring club in Vermont. And um, the uh, senior instructor, one of the senior instructors has been around there forever who lectures people on all kinds of things, uh, just uh, did something really stupid, just got low on final, which uh, is not supposed to happen when you fly gliders. And, and where the student flew it through the trees, everybody was, was safe, but the airplane was totaled. Um, and then another senior member did something similar, you know, six months later. 
this is just, uh, you know, I, as I said to my brother, there's something wrong with your club. These are the leaders. These are the senior leaders. And this is what often happens with a flying club that we cannot self-correct because it's too embarrassing to go to the, the founder or the leader or the one who's, who's bankrolled the club for, for whatever, uh, in one of these cases I just mentioned, um, uh, and, and, and get it corrected. Uh, and so that's part of what I think we do pretty well with the club um, and that, uh, uh, you know, try to be clear about everybody needs check rides and everybody needs to take them seriously. And, and to <laughs> understand if we're on the board or, or in senior leadership position, we have to teach by example. That is huge. I always but, yeah. emphasize. Go ahead. Insurance program. Say again, John. When did Dick and Caitlin get involved in the okay. insurance program? Dick, Dick Kenny came to the club about 1990, something like that, maybe. Yep. And um, I doubt too many people on this call know Dick. Uh, uh, he has, in later years, he's 91 now and lives down in Atlanta where his family wanted him closer at hand. And uh, I still talk to Dick about it every two years. As a matter of fact, I exchanged calls with him two hours ago. But uh, Dick came to the club about 1990 and he had moved here from Long Island. Uh, he had a long history in the insurance business and in particular the aviation insurance business. I didn't know that. Uh, it just fell to me to check him out. He came to the club, checked him out in the Skyhawk we had then, uh, and I checked him out in the Mooney, and uh, came to know him and like him, and he never mentioned that he was in the aviation insurance business. And years later, I asked him about that, and he said, George, um, I do not want to trade on my friendships for cultivating business. Uh, business is business and uh, and friendships are something else and uh, I did not want to appear to be coming to the club to cultivate business and uh, he also said something else to me later he said you know I wondered if I could join the club um, and uh, it seemed kind of exclusive to me and we fought against that for years people think oh, it's a club so I have to know people or be a friend of people to Please, everybody understand and let everybody else know we are inclusive, not exclusive. But Dick, um, I only found out tangentially that he was in the aviation insurance business. And so I said, after knowing for a couple of years, I said, Dick, let's talk about our insurance. And he said, well, if you insist. And since then, he has um, shepherded us through good times and bad and uh, has left us with... Uh, an insurance policy that is $2 million smooth and without going into a lot of detail about how aviation insurance policies are structured, uh, it does not allow subrogation and has a lot of other advantages to it. Um, there's not, it's not sublimited and I'd be happy to talk about insurance with anyone here or elsewhere who's in the club and wants to know what kind of insurance we have. It's not the time and place for a lecture on aviation insurance, but um, let me just say that I've been flying for, I don't know how, 30, at least 30 years and before that too, and never had an accident, never had an incident, um, got a lot of hours, a lot of certificates and ratings. I cannot go out in the market and get a policy for myself in my airplane that is as good as the policy that all of us here on this call get simply for being a member of the Wings of Carolina Flying Club. And when I ask my broker, which used to be Dick, and, and that responsibility has been handed off to someone in uh, a partnership that he works for up in New England, uh, named Caitlin. But uh, when I ask her, and I used to ask Dick why I could not get a policy as good as he got us for the club, and he would just say, George, you know, drop 25 years and buy a newer airplane. But the fact is, it's true. Just for being a member of the club, regardless of your experience, uh, regardless of your certificates or ratings, um, 
you would be very hard put to go out and get a policy at any cost uh, that is equal to what you get simply by being a member of the club. Thanks, John. And I think that's really important to keep that in mind if we want that privilege of having such a great insurance policy, it, we really have to work on our safety record at all times and not rest on our laurels. And that's, that is, that is difficult to do sometimes in clubs with changing of the guards and, uh, you know, and people moving in, moving out and, and take for granted that the safety record will just continue somehow, but it does not continue unless it's very actively pushed. And that, that is what I think we've convinced the, uh, the brokers that's an insurance companies that's what we do uh and uh, at least that's that's what we try to do so to keep this wonderful insurance policy that we have we also have a policy that um and there are people on this call michael ridmack and graham mannering and some others who are very familiar with this because they've dealt with our insurance policy in recent years uh, and are dealing with it now uh, uh tam our treasurer is is He's well aware of this now. We will not be flying for the next couple of weeks and who knows after that. And while we're not flying, we're saving a lot of money on our insurance policy because we have something that is almost unheard of in the industry. We have a policy that has a base rate and then an additional rate based on our number of flying hours, which is why we're always cautioning everyone to be very careful when you enter your Hobbs time after your flight, because we submit a record of that Hobbs time to our insurance underwriter and they prorate our insurance based on that. So that's unheard of. That's not, that's not a part of my insurance policy. I pay every month whether my airplane flies or sits on the ramp. So that's another advantage of the policy we have that helps keep our costs down. And that's just a function of the fact that we've been good customers and have protected the policy over the years. Uh, John, I have a picture here, which will take me a moment to bring up, uh, of our, back in the early 90s, building what was, we called the annex to our <laughs> Shack, and I'm going to share that briefly, and you'll recognize the picture, and you'll recognize the people in it. Um, oh, I, don't yeah. know if Dave, I don't know if Dave Strebel is on this call. I haven't looked through all the the uh, names of the 70 or so people who are, uh, but I can talk about some of the people in that picture, um, including the reprobate out there and standing apart on the left. But uh, I'm <laughs> the sure guy with, the guy with the sunglasses, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, I know. He's, he looks like the club drug dealer. Uh, but <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about um, the facilities that we had in Chapel Hill. You know, we should have started this out by saying that um, you actually, whether you know it or not, are a member of the Chapel Hill Flying Club because uh, legally, that's what we are, because we started in Chapel Hill in 1963, and in 1991, in a moment we'll talk about that move too, but in 1991, um, I'm sorry, 2001, we moved down to Sanford, and we'll talk about that a little bit too, but for up until 2001, from 63 to 2001, we operated out of Horace Williams Airport in Chapel Hill, and that is a saga too that we could talk about for a long time. Um, but uh, what you're looking at uh, on the left there is our shack, and you can see right between me and Robert Bailey the first part of the word shack because that's what the sign said, and I have a story about that too. But uh, look at that, and behind us you can see under construction the shack annex. So, John, talk a little bit about how that came be. Okay. Um, well, the story is that... Uh, uh, the, the airport management, uh, which reported to the university administration, uh, felt under the gun. I mean, they both did, the administration, the management, uh, because there was an active group in Chapel Hill 
who really wanted the airport shut down. Um, this is a, a classic uh, situation where the airport had been around since the 30s. Um, it was built on property donated for the purpose of an airport by Horace Williams, a, a philosophy professor at, uh, at UNC who acquired a farm and then uh, uh, when he, uh, uh, late in life, uh, thought about what could the university use that it didn't have and the, the idea was an airport. And, uh, you know, in those days, that was the coming thing. This is how you were successful. So I donated the farm for the purpose of an airport. and. Um, uh, there, there was, uh, and of course, the, the road that went uh, uh, north out of Chapel Hill up to Hillsborough was called Airport Road. It's now been changed to, to um, Martin Luther King Boulevard, but it was Airport Road for uh, about 70 years. Um, and, um, uh, and it was out in the boonies then and out in the farm country. And uh, the town grew slowly, but uh, surely out, outwards until it engulfed, engulfed the airport, at least on uh, two sides. Uh, the university, part of the, the property went well beyond the airport. There was an acreage to the north of there that was even more than what the airport was situated on. But the bottom line is this pressure group or just anti-flying um, uh, people who uh, were alarmists, uh, who would go to all the um, the town council meetings and to uh, the board meetings uh, of UNC and complain both vociferously that this terrible, terrible thing was in our midst that would lead to death and destruction and airplanes crashing into schools, which they had built off the end of either runway um, long after the airport was there. Uh, but this happens all over the country. This, uh, if you're not zoned and if you don't take care of your airport, uh, it is encroached upon and then you're outvoted. The, the, uh, People are alerted by groups like this one to, to uh, frantically work to close the airport, uh, thinking that it is a, a nuisance at best and, and a danger uh, that it's right in the midst. Uh, the safety record of the airport is unblemished, of course, in terms of anybody being hurt or killed uh, anywhere around the airport by anything to do with the airport, but that, that's another matter. Um, so consequently, um, Part of what happened was that the uh, that group pressured the university to make sure that anything that happened on the airport was officially um, blessed by UNC. And uh, we had a little bit of this history of being a, a student flying club for a while, but it was clear that uh, we weren't anymore. And just our presence there was pushed by this group as being uh, uh, not unlawful so much as just inappropriate. And they kept trying to push to kick the flying club off because we were the major tenant and, and did much of the flying. Um, uh, the, air, the university itself uh, had the AHEC program, which was founded in the 60s. And, and that's why the, the runway was paid to start with uh, uh, so that they could fly their, their Aztecs and fly uh, doctors around the state. So they had their own interest in keeping the airport open, but we were the one actually who probably bought more fuel and kept it alive day by day. Uh, their fleet of Aztecs, basically, the majority of them would fly outbound in the morning and fly, you know, inbound in the evening, whereas we, on our good years, would be flying all day and the weekends, too. So we were a major source of uh, revenue uh, for the airport and fuel sales and so forth. But they, the people who were against this went to the town and they went, made sure that zoning-wise, we could not have a, a, a clubhouse. We had no place to be. Um, so we did wrangle a trailer for a while, a single wide trailer, house trailer that was put on the, on, uh, on the side of the parking lot there at Horace Williams, but they eventually got that banned and we had nowhere to go. So we have this lean-to hangar, which you can see above these little structures, it's under a roof. And the idea was <laughs> that th this was not a permanent resident, we uh, mean building, we did not need to get a, um, uh, a building permit. Uh, we could construct a portable uh, building inside the hangar that we leased. Uh, and this was uh, just uh, one side was open, it had a roof and it had a backside on it. And this was one of the ones that Pebbly Barrow and friends had built many, many years before. And uh, so we built these on skids and argued that we're, we're not here. They're not hooked up to plumbing, you know, uh, 
we kind of schmoozed the idea of getting electricity, which you put in ourselves, but didn't have to go through the, the county to get permits. And so we had our little shack, uh, which is a one room shack you see there with the window already in it. Uh, and that was uh, about eight feet by 12 feet. That was our entire facility. And so here we are duplicating another eight feet by 12 foot building um, right there. Uh, this actually is a little bigger, I think it was 10 by 12. So we would have another room that instructors could sit in and, and actually talk to people uh, rather than having everybody in the same room all the time. So this is our history and we had great years. Uh, those years went really well uh, in terms of the camaraderie and you see some fine people that were absolutely committed to the club there, John Domena uh, and uh, uh, the um, Robert Bailey uh, and obviously David Strebel became president uh, and you know George and myself uh, and Mark Boy. he wasn't there that long but he really dove in when he was there um, and just great commitment to helping the club and pushing forward and establishing ourselves so there are some fine fine people right there um, let me see by pure, pure coincidence uh, four out of the six are flight instructors that's true. And uh, this is just, I don't say this because it's personal, but uh, it is true that um, most of the people in that picture are still good friends of mine. I played tennis with Robert Bailey last summer. John DeMena, I talked to once a week, almost unfailingly. Uh, David Strebel uh, was club president for a good while. And uh, I love to tell a story about David. Uh, the airport at Harris Williams once upon a time had an airport day where they invited the public out to the airport, as airports should do. And uh, David went and bought some lumber, went back to his house, built a sign, which he put on the side of the shack that said Capitol Flying Club Shack. And I got a call that night from a club member who said, you know, that's all wrong. It creates the wrong impression. And, uh, it's not dignified and so on and so on and so on. And um, I, uh, and it has always been for me sort of uh, symbolic of how the club works. And I said to him, look, if you don't like what it says, you go build a sign and drive it down there and hang it on the wall and that'll be fine too. But uh, David is the one who took the initiative, made the effort, put in the work. And I'm proud to have that sign representing the club. And uh, to this day, David still is a member and a participant of the club. We don't see him as much as we would like, but uh, you'll see him around taking pictures at Second Saturday. And uh, I still regard him as a very good friend, as I do the other people in that picture. Uh, uh, we're like coming up on it? 9 o'clock. I don't want to keep people here all evening. Uh, I don't know how many people are still enduring, but. Uh, like to talk for a minute about how we came to operate at Sanford. Uh, we could talk about the controversy over the Horace Williams Airport for a long, long time. Uh, I'm proud to say that so far as I know, uh, the last three airplanes to leave Horace Williams on the day it finally shut down uh, were three Cubs piloted by Tim Ferriss, Bob Epting, and myself. And uh, I have a picture of those Cubs over Horace Williams in the fading light. And uh, is one of the uh, one of the enduring memories of my whole flying career, um, and um, sad in a whole lot of ways, bittersweet, let's say. So um, we come to about the year 2000, and the pressure on the university to close the airport, and uh, we had chancellor at the university at that time. We really wanted to close the airport. I'm not going to relitigate all that. I'd be happy to with anyone personally if you want to hear more about it but now's not the time and place and uh, it became time for the Chapel Hill Flying Club to look for a new home. This is one of those times when um, another flying club might very well have just folded the tent and walked away said you know we had a good run and uh, there's nowhere for us to go so let's give everybody back their money and um, you know we'll all go um, pick up bowling. But uh, that has not been the history of the club over the years. We've been through some hard times, as John mentioned. We've been through depressions when people stopped flying. Uh, we have been through um, at least one tragic accident, which we've talked about. 
and we have been bankrupt probably a couple of times. We just figured it out before the bank did and fixed it. Um, I hasten to say we are, are now and have been for a, a number of years now on really sound financial footing, thanks largely to Matt Law and Graham Mannering, who may or may not be listening, but uh, we've had intelligent, sound financial management for at least 10 years now, and our, our bottom line reflects it, and that's how we're going to get through this next period of time, however long it is. Um, so uh, you can trust that we are in sound financial shape. Does not mean that, you know, things can't change. We've all been surprised. But uh, so 2000, it was time for the flying club to find a new home. We sent out scouting parties to area airports, Triple W, an airport over kind of near Fuquay Varina, south of Raleigh, uh, was actually for sale at the time. And we went and looked at the possibility of even purchasing it. You know, how great to own your own airport, but there were a lot of problems with it um, and to this day. Um, it was just not what we needed. We looked at Person County up at Roxborough. We sent a scouting party, of a few members up there, and uh, it um, was not ideally located, and uh, the, the facilities up there were not what we had hoped for at that time, you know, available hangars and so on. And uh, we sent a scouting party down to the new airport that had just been built north of Sanford. Sanford was avid for development then, still is, unlike some of our communities. And I'm, that's not a judgment, it's just a fact. And uh, they built a new airport, the old downtown airport, which you pass over just about the time you pass over ICTAO on the uh, ILS-3 to our current airport at Sanford. You look down there, it's was once a runway that now has big exits on it. That was the old downtown Sanford Airport. Sanford built an airport as close to Raleigh-Durham as you can possibly get and still be in Lee County, up in the northern tip of Lee County, and that's the airport we operate out now. So for a few years, I had been flying with students south of Chapel Hill and seeing this airport under construction, watching it from day to day. And, uh, it was completed just about that time that we were looking for a new home. So I, I know David Strevel and I think Richard Binkley, who was an instructor with us at the time, and I went down to Sanford and met with um, Dan Swanson, who was the airport manager at the time and owned a shop there. And I see someone else wants in here. So let's see if we can make that happen. Um, Okay, so we drove down there, and I'll never forget, we drove down US-1, we took the Ferro Road exit, we crossed back over, we turned down Rod Sullivan Road, and we think, I remember thinking, there cannot possibly be an airport here. Um, we passed, you know, rural homes, and a little winding road, and sure enough, we came over the railroad bridge, as many of us do every day to this day, and there was an airport, and uh, it looked a lot different than it does now. A lot fewer hangars, a lot more open space, but a 6,000-foot runway and an ILS, uh, a maintenance shop, and we thought we were in heaven. So we met with Dan Swanson. He was um, skeptical of us because we were coming from somewhere else, and we were coming from Chapel Hill, and, you know, I didn't need to say more. And uh, he was pretty skeptical, but we walked uh, the facility with him. We walked up and down, looked at the hangars that were there then, looked at the runway, talked it over, and uh, came back and said, you know, this is going to be tough because a lot of people are not going to want to move down to Sanford uh, for cultural reasons. Sanford seemed like a long way away to a lot of our members, but we said, you know, um, that's where we need to go. And uh, we um, Rented a house trailer. Jim Carlson was a large part of that and uh, got some space arranged with Dan and the airport authority to get some space up at the north end of the airport. Uh, and uh, Jim Carlson put together a bunch of us and we built a deck in his driveway and 
dragged it down there on a trailer and put it up on the south side of the trailer that uh, we were setting up our headquarters in and we arranged for water and sewer and who knows what else. And uh, we had some engineers in the club at the time who uh, directed us in what we needed to do. And uh, we had a big event. We flew out of Horace Williams in a gaggle all together and we tried to get the media involved and uh, both for our departure and our arrival at Sanford. We flew in a loose formation down there and we made a new home. And uh, John, who had been doing maintenance out in the freezing cold and the blazing heat out in the yard, you drop a screw, you just go get another one because you'll never find it. And uh, we rented space in a hangar owned by Buddy Keller, who was instant, who was important in the in the development of that airport, and still flies out of it. We rented space in his hangar, and John did maintenance in in the hangar uh, across from our trailer. And uh, then we started negotiating for a permanent place and raising money to build uh, our own facility down there, which we'd never had an opportunity to do at Chapel Hill, where uh, the university owned the airport and the town owned the, the uh, land around it and they were at loggerheads so we had to operate out of a temporary shack on skids. So now we had the opportunity to raise money and build a facility. Uh, somehow or another we did it. Uh, Jim Carlson was instrumental in the engineering and the design of the building but a lot of other people pitched in on the design too. And uh, while we were operating out of the trailer one day I was uh, flying an approach to runway three and I looked out there and the south end of the airport was completely unoccupied. The hangars that are there now were not there then and I remember looking out and uh, thinking that's where we need to be down at the south end out of the frag pattern as Jimmy Bauer used to say and uh, where we can have a place of our own that looks out on the runway because up at the north end even then the airport authority wanted that preserved for corporate hangars and uh, didn't want us up there and said, sure, we could be up there, but we had to be far removed from the ramp and the runway. And uh, so we seized upon the place where we are now, which gives us access to the ramp, access to the runway, and uh, a number of our members pitched in uh, after we built the first facility to build that deck. So now we can sit out on that deck on a sunny day and critique each other's landings. And uh, I feel like it is the home we always deserve. So uh, for those still with us, um, questions, thoughts, complaints, concerns about the history of the club or where we stand now or where we need to go. This is a whole other discussion. I'd like to have another discussion about the safety record of the club and uh, how we have tried to manage that over the years. So there are a lot of topics I'd like to talk about, but you know, you all have been very patient. So I'll open the floor and uh, you tell us. While they're hesitating, uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, we've had a pretty good run of management in the club. Uh, you know, I'm uh, looking at, at uh, John's uh, little standard there, still with us, I gather. You are, John. As an example of a president who really got it and worked very hard and, uh, you know, was helpful in our growth and, uh, you know, helped us along. We've, we've had a lot of good presidents over the years. We've had some, maybe not, but overall, I think we've been extremely fortunate by having good people volunteer and who get who we are and work hard to maintain the standards and, and, and the culture. So I just wanted to say that while I'm thinking about it. Thank you, John. Any comments on when we started using the Moonies? Sure. Uh, John, John remembers that because he was instrumental in it. John has always been kind of a enthusiast of Moonies. And uh, we've been through many of them in the, in the years. I have fond memories of many that have come and gone. So John, yeah. speak to, John, please speak to how you started the club flying Moonies, because it's not very common for flying yeah. clubs, because it's not an idiot proof airplane as we have proved. Yeah, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's true. Moonies always uh, appealed to me for their efficiency and, and, uh, uh, and, and speed, given the horsepower they have. Uh, 
but and the argument was for many years who are we as a club and when we just had uh, 150s or 152s and Skyhawks, and then uh, and then occasionally some Piper, low wing Piper mixed in, uh, we would go to board meetings and there would always be uh, proponents of both sides of that equation. Like we are who we are. We now have a whatever it was at, uh, at the time I joined a 15 year history, a 20 year history, a 25 year history of being who we are and we're successful being a low end club with um, just a trainer and, and a basic four, uh, four place airplane, 150 horsepower, four place, four place airplane. Uh, but then there was others who said, I would like to move up. I would like to fly a retractable airplane. And I became uh, a partisan to that event saying, this would not hurt us to move this far. We don't have to necessarily get uh, a very expensive six seater, 300 horsepower engine airplane at this point, but uh, for the the power and the dollar, you know, I was saying a Mooney might be a good choice. The other choice would have been a, an Arrow, uh, uh, Piper Arrow. Um, but uh, I apparently convinced the board that we should try one out. I found a, a good one to purchase, and we got our first uh, uh, Mooney uh, in, I can't remember the dates. It was probably in the uh, early 80s. Is that right, George? Uh, somewhere in there. And they've yeah. been very successful with the club overall, although sometimes, about right. uh, sometimes they're not flown as much as they would like to be. But uh, for those who get into them, they are, in fact, a very efficient cross-country airplane and have the joys of uh, retractable gear and, and, and pretty good avionics uh, in terms of what they got. Not the highest end, but you can keep up with most anybody speed-wise with a Mooney and a 200 horsepower engine, unless you really want to jack it up to 300 horsepower. You're you're going to get there pretty quickly. We I, had, go I, ahead. Have been, I have become an enthusiast of the Mooney Mark, and I have learned so much from John about them. And um, in one case, what I learned from John by pestering him with questions in the hangar one night probably saved my life. That's a, a whole other story. But there are a few people around who know as much about Mooney's as John. I will say that right now. Um, I see John Gaither uh, on the line here, at least he has been. Uh, and John has put together over the years, um, at least once, a fleet committee that uh, was tasked with trying to help us decide. Every five years or so, we try to look at our fleet and think about, as John said, you know, in business and and we're not a we're not a commercial operation not a profit making operation but we have to pay our bills so we are a business in that sense and you know some businesses succeed by just doing what they do well and continuing to do it other businesses do well by looking ahead and trying to anticipate and going into new areas and it's always a balance and it's always a struggle for the club um, we don't try to be on the leading edge of uh, innovative general aviation airplanes, but we know that uh, we can't keep flying the same things forever necessarily. And so periodically we look at what we should be flying and what we should look ahead to and what we should anticipate. And about five years ago, I don't know, it could be more by now, I don't know. Um, John put together a task force as others have uh, before. Um, and John, you want to say a little bit about how you went about that process? We could talk for a long time about it, but turn up your mic. Okay, there we go. I'll mention it and uh, try to be reasonably brief. Uh, we put together a group of people who were involved with various aircraft, uh, involved with finance of aircraft, uh, and had a wide instructors had a wide variety of uh, talent on the uh, on the committee, and we analyzed a number of different aircraft that might be useful uh, for the club. I still think that the uh, even if all the analysis may have become a little dated, I think that the appendix to the uh, Fleet Committee report is still uh, 
is still highly valuable uh, because it analyzes various planes that the club uh, might get into and it outlines where we uh, where we think we ought to be going. I noticed that Ken Williams was on the call. I'm not sure whether he still is or not, uh, but he was one member of the fleet committee. George was uh, another. So if you want the detailed report, uh, it's still very much available. Uh, if you want some of the people who worked on the report uh, who are more nearby than I am, uh, the report is uh, uh, those two are very much available, and uh, uh, I don't think it's a bad time for the, the club to be uh, dusting off uh, some of those thoughts, especially with the hours um, as they were uh, shortly before uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, came along. And I expect that the club will bounce back with hours. And as you look to expand the fleet uh, uh, over time, uh, I think some of the, uh, uh, to do it in a thoughtful manner uh, would be very valuable. Yeah, John has served as president of the club. Um, he has um, helped us a lot with finances, which is part of his background. Financial projections, the sort of thing that are gonna see us through these difficult times we've been and he is even though he now lives far away from here he has uh, continued to take an interest in the club and uh, he and I argue back and forth about things we disagree um, about and I always learn something in the process and it's always civil which is something I've appreciated um, about the club um, we're now up to you know an hour and a quarter probably uh, I will stay here as long as anybody has a question and would like to talk about something. I would like to uh, introduce something before we close out tonight, uh, which will take maybe five or 10 minutes. I'm just gonna share my screen and show you something. But um, any other questions, any other uh, complaints, concerns? I just wanna jump in real quick. And uh, this is Paula Wilder and uh, just thank uh, George and John um, for all their work with the club and the history. I remember as a young kid, um, you know, I was starting to fly in 152 occasionally and I got my solo at 16, but I had this old cover of a magazine when Porsche had tried their engine on the Mooney and that was gonna make it the greatest plane ever. And of course that failed miserably. But I had the cover of that magazine on my door thinking, now there's a plane I'll never get to fly, this amazing Mooney thing. and and but it, you know at least I'm flying. I'm in this 152, and it's great. But there's a plane I'll never get my hands on. And you know what? Here I am in the flying club, and I've flown a Mooney all over the place. And uh, what a great opportunity! And I just really thank uh, John Hunter and George Shear here for all their great work. And I should also just share one anecdotal thing in, in saying that thank you and how great their work is. It's a long time ago, about 10 years ago, I was looking for something. Um, on the internet uh, for aircraft and, and for some reason I came across a document um, from Sweden about 172 so I thought gosh that looks interesting and I scrolled down and the at the bottom it said the owner of the document was GFS and if you don't happen to know it said George's middle initial is F in fact the our 172 document that I think John Hunter originated and George had improved upon was so great that it was hijacked by this company, this, this aviation organization in Sweden. So, uh, you know what? We of Carolina were international. So I just really <laughs> appreciate uh, all your great work um, and, and making us what we are and providing all of us with the opportunities that we've had. And it's really uh, very special to me. Yeah, I could look down this list of participants here and mention a lot of people. Paul has uh, served the club um, admirably in some of our difficult times and uh, has been president of the club several times and uh, has done a lot of forensic accounting for the club uh, over the years. And uh, But I could go down this list that I see here of participants and talk about each one of a number of people for quite a long time. Uh, the My son, uh, once upon a time, not too long ago, uh, wasted an afternoon 
looking around the country at flying clubs. And uh, he, in an informal uh, survey, he decided that the Wings of Carolina was about the third largest flying club in the country. Uh, second to, I think, the Boeing uh, Employees Flying Club. Um, I'm not sure of its current state. Um, it has its challenges just as we have. Uh, and the, the uh, West Valley Flying Club in Palo Alto, California, which is famous and in some cases infamous as um, a very large and luxurious flying club. And uh, the Wings of Carolina is not the oldest flying club in the country, but um, it is one of the oldest and it has endured uh, for more than 50 years. I like to say we've discovered the secret of surviving in aviation. We just don't try to make money, which is the mistake many people make. So uh, any other questions, thoughts, concerns? And then I'm going to just introduce something for five minutes or so, and then we'll all go back to our real lives. I will take that as a no, uh, but interrupt me uh, if I was premature about that. Um, I have up on my screen something that I want to share with you, which we're going to try to, um, my son just dinged me and said it's actually the second oldest as far as he can tell, um, but that's, uh, that's not an official statement, it's just, um, yeah, he's pretty smart about those things. Anyway, um, what, with the help of Dwight Fry, uh, who I mentioned earlier, uh, Dwight is a club flight instructor, a longtime club member, and a uh, man of many talents, built one of the most beautiful RVs uh, to ever fly. Uh, we put together what, for lack of a better name, we call him the Learning Center, uh, where instructors can put up topics that they would like to talk about or teach, and uh, members can go to this site, and we'll roll this out tomorrow or the next day. Uh, and look, this is just the scheduled event for tonight, but if we look over here, um, these are potential events or topics that uh, I've put up most of these, but uh, a lot of the ideas came from other flight instructors. And these are just ideas at this point. You can think of this as just a bucket of ideas. Uh, but what, as a member, we would be doing is going here to look for actual events. And uh, if we click on this event, you can see a description of it, some idea of the topic, uh, the information for joining, if it's done online. And some of these may be done on Zoom, some may be done on other tools. It's up to the instructor who wants to offer it. And uh, any information about payment, uh, however, the instructor wants to handle that. Um, you're looking at my version of it, which has some administrative things here. But uh, that's other than if you're a geek for uh, stuff like Svelte JavaScript and Docker and Mongo database and so on, you can have a lot of fun with this. But basically, the idea is each of us as a member will be able to go to this, check it periodically. So we're not always going to ding you with um, emails, but and look in there and see if there's something you're interested in. Click on it, see how to join it, see um, if it's something that you want to do. And uh, as instructors, we will just keep trying to brainstorm, come up with ideas. Um, and some of these are conversations like we had tonight. Some of them are topics that we might want to teach. Uh, you know, periodically I do something on uh, flying multi-engine airplanes or tailwheel flying. Um, we can draft our uh, maintenance people to help us talk about aircraft electrical systems. I'm working with Will Warren uh, to put together something about that and about our autopilots and our GPSs, which people are always curious about. So it's a lot of work, but our instructors want to teach. Um, they want to work, they want to teach, they want to learn. And so we are Oh, there's Larry Smith. There's Larry Smith. Welcome. Uh, so I'm going to roll this out in the next day or two, and then it'll be up to us to participate. 
as instructors and as members. And uh, as I said, at the start of all this, what I'm really hoping for is, here we go. What I'm really hoping for is that this will be the start of a means by which we can keep in touch as members. And while we are worried about the other difficult challenges in our life right now, we can talk about flying, which is why we all came here. And uh, some of us continue to work toward our aviation goals and others of us sit around and reminisce about the good old days. So uh, you know how to reach me, cfi at wingsofcarolina.org or my personal email. Um, please reach out if you have ideas. Uh, if this bored you to death, I trust you'd be gone by now, but uh, just let us know. And I just want us all to keep in touch and keep the sense of community that has uh, made the club a very special place over all these years and a source of many, many deep friendships for me. So thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, you guys for putting this on. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Thanks, John. Thanks, Definitely. Thanks, Good. George. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Now, out of curiosity, what were the numbers, George? Oh. <laughs> they came and go. How many? 5960 at one point. I, 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 saw, I saw 64 at one point. Yeah, I saw 68 at one point. Oh, great. You know what's great is I recognize all those voices. Uh, yeah. And um, like I said, the source of many, many really great friendships for me. Uh, so. Lots yeah. of more stories to tell. Uh, <laughs> John and I could go on for a long, long time, as you know. Yeah. yeah. But let's do this again. You know, maybe next week at the same time. Sounds I would right. like that. I would enjoy it. Good. I will. I will schedule it, and uh, I will work on the production values in the meantime. But thanks a lot. Um, when everyone drops off, I'll go ahead and shut down the meeting. See you later. I'm going to go ahead and drop off. Thanks, Jim. Same. Thanks for thanks. all you've done. Well, that was a good turnout then if there was up to 68 at one point. Very gratified. Yeah. Uh, Short notice. Uh, very gratified. Uh, and after everybody drops off, John, you and I can take a moment and talk. And sure. uh, then, you know, go back to work. Yeah. You guys saw that Caitlin joined? I beg your pardon? You, you saw that Caitlin joined? Uh, that's Caitlin, um, our member and one of the prime drivers of the GoFundMe, GoFundMe campaign, not the Caitlin that manages our insurance. Uh, Caitlin with our insurance is supposed to why. Caitlin, who has become in a short time a very important club member, uh, is spelled with him. L-I-N, that's, that's how it's Yeah, and I see that name up there. Hey, Lynn, thanks for doing the GoFundMe. We really appreciate that. Yeah, I'll second that. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to go out publicly and, uh, and talk about uh, the Raleigh Flight School who uh, took a whole different approach to this crisis with their instructors. Uh, but I cannot think of a clearer line between um, who they are and who we are at our best. Um, at our best, we are a pretty incredible community. You know, when people call me as they do several times a week and say, you know, I want someplace looking for some place to fly or I'm looking for uh, a place to learn to fly. Uh, I tell them about all the other flight schools around. I know it draws 
probably drives Paul crazy, but uh, I uh, I tell him go check out Blue Line and Flight Jest and Burling Vernon and uh, Lewisburg uh, and uh, find what works best for you. It's not always the Flying Club, but when people want to know what makes the Flying Club different, I just say collegiality, community. You know, it's not just a place you go on Tuesday for a couple of hours to take your uh, flight lesson. It's, and you can do that at the club. We're all busy, but it's a place where you can make deep friendships. It's a place where you can meet other people. It's a place where you can learn how to buy and sell and own airplanes. Um, it's a place where you can learn about aviation in the broader sense. And, uh, you know, we certainly demonstrated that with that campaign. I was, you know, and it wasn't just, um, you know, somebody dropping a $5,000 check in there. Um, I will say that um, several members came to me and said, if we have an instructor who can't make the rent this month, I will write a $4,000 check uh, to get them through. Um, but I want to remain anonymous. And, uh, that did not prove necessary because of the work that Caitlin and uh, some others did. And um, I, it's just extraordinary. And, it, and it, it, again, it wasn't somebody dropping a $5,000 check in. It was 100, 150 or more people, you know, making a contribution of what they felt was appropriate and what they could afford. In some cases, probably a little more than that. And uh, so it was the participation as much as the as the dollar total that moved me. You're here. Yeah, agreed. I'm going to drop off, but uh, just a couple notes where people saying thank you, um, and, and I'm sure everyone really appreciated this. And uh, one, one person said we should get a six seater, <laughs> which, I, <laughs> which I always find, which I always find fun. But get uh, what? I, I missed that. What was that word? We should get what? Uh, get us, get us a uh, six seater so that we have a high performance that carries <laughs> more people. Kind of thing. So, which, hey, which is, that, which how is, many times have we had that discussion, Paul? <laughs> which, uh, a lot of times, a lot of times. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily against it, but I'm just not sure it would fly at the club. That's my only concern. You know, it'll be the weekend holiday, high demand, and then it'll sit the rest of the time, maybe. But uh, who knows? Who knows? That, that's but anyway, I'm going to drop off. Thank you, thank you guys so much okay. for doing this. Appreciate it. Hello, Adam. How was your flight, Adam? Stepped away. Yeah, perhaps so. He's out in uh, Palo Alto. So Adam and Caitlin and, and uh, Graham are still on, on yeah. online. Yeah. 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 I'm pleased that Graham hung in there. Yeah, I'm still hanging out trying to figure out how to unmute the mic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 to I, I was making that remark. <laughs> trying to figure out what, Graham? How to unmute, he said. Yeah, oh. how to unmute the microphone. And this is the first uh, Zoom meeting I've tried taking from my iPad rather than. Uh, the controls are not quite as easy on an iPad. I figured that out. Uh, uh, I think we can stop the recording now. Yeah, probably a good idea. Yeah. Are you, are you uh, is this, this is a personal account? Are you 